clock has been doctored so as not to reveal the fact that we kept you waiting. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, my lord, my lady. Um, it, uh, it, it won't surprise the court that um, we've taken the opportunity overnight to reflect upon uh, my lord, Lord Justice Holroyd's hypothetical yes. of the hostage. And uh, my team thankfully put me back on the right track when I went off down a crooked path, and having given the answer yes yesterday, that there would be, in that situation, uh, control uh, such that the respondent would be required to secure the release, the answer is actually no, there wouldn't be. And I'm going to endeavour to explain why that is. So, the respondent is the constructive custodian. If he has the power to decide if A remains in custody or not. And if. Hang on one second. Yep. If he does have that power, he cannot avoid its exercise by refusing to take the steps necessary to comply with the writ and to bring the applicant before the court because he doesn't want to take those steps. <clears throat> the coercive power and force of the writ requires that he does take those steps, regardless of his wishes. So if we look at Mr. Ramatullah's situation, he, the, the, the Secretary of State could not have defeated um, the writ being issued in Mr. Ramatullah's case on the basis that he didn't want <coughs> to issue the necessary documents, travel documents and so forth, and take what other steps were necessary in order to secure the release of Mr. Ramatullah from Bagram and his production before the court in London. Um, Ramatullah was dual nationality? No. He was Pakistani? He was Pakistani. Oh, he was a Pakistani national. So he would have had to be issued with travel documents. Travel documents and brought to court. <coughs> the first part, sorry, I don't want to distract you, but the, the first part would have been easy because suppose that the Americans had agreed to return him. Um, they would no doubt simply have put him on a plane from Bagram to um, Kabul Airport or wherever the British wanted to, to take charge of him. And... Um, it's the next stage that then would have required the Secretary of State to act. Um, <clears throat> the particular complications that arise in this case it wouldn't have arisen in Ramatullah. The practical complications. The practical well, you call them practical. They're more than practical. Yes, the, the, the business of actually affecting the handover and delivering um, to... Uh, the Secretary of State or to the UK government uh, was not likely to be very problematic in Ramatullah. Nobody talked about it. Yes, they could have. They could have asked them to come and get him. They could, the Americans could have said, "Come and get him and take him back to yes, the United right. Kingdom." Yes, right. And it would have had to have been yes. done. In Sorry, that this way. is just, this is though. It's I think a point of importance. It's not the point you're on at the moment. It's my fault for um, uh, interrupting your flow. You go on. So those, those practical considerations together with the considerations of diplomacy, are irrelevant. They are not a basis for either concluding there is no control or, unnecessarily <coughs> therefore, for not issuing the writ, because that is what the writ requires the respondent to do. Now, if we look at the circumstances of this case, yes, it is right that a condition has been imposed, but if you look at the nature of the condition, that condition is simply to do that which is required by the writ itself. So complying with that condition is, it is simply the fulfilment of the conditions inherent in the issue of the writ itself, inherent in the exercise of the power to direct release and bring the applicant to court. So they don't add anything to the conditions at all to what is
is already there by virtue of the ring. Can I just um, hand up to the court the... Um, Sorry, I'd, you can, but I just want to see where this is going. We're a long ways, you still haven't come close to well, Justice Holroyd's point. <coughs> what, what you're going to say that this is a different kind of condition, the condition in Lord Justice Holroyd's example is a different kind of condition. It's, a, it, it, it's an impermissible condition. It's oh, a condition I, I, I understand condition that, but I just... It doesn't give it, 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 uh, a circumstance <coughs> in which there is an ability to secure the release, which involves complying with a condition <coughs> such as that, is not such as to give rise to the requisite power over the detention. That's the point, because that power only arises if the condition is then fulfilled. Whereas, in, in take Ramatullah, for example, one has there a situation in which the power arises in the form of a request for release. The power resides in the ability to request release pursuant to either the obligation or the um, uh, uh, MOU, both of which are factual features of the case, which mean that should there be compliance on the part of the respondent with those obligations, then a mere <coughs> request for release Will result. But can I get? Is this your proposition? A power to obtain release that can only be exercised subject to a condition does not constitute control for the relevant purposes. Save that if the quotes condition is no more than is required anyway, Precisely. it's not really a condition at all. Precisely. But, but, but I wonder, Ms. Kaufman, whether there's an element of circularity here. Because <coughs> in, in, at any rate, some situations, I would say whether this case or not, at any rate, in some situations, it's only the fulfillment of the condition which puts the uh, respondent in a position of power to control release or, or detention. Well, that's certainly so, not so when the you situation. say it's no, no more than the writ requires, the, the, the writ requires it of someone who has the requisite control. If they only have the requisite control by fulfilment of the condition, does just raise an issue in my mind as to whether that's rather a circular approach. But, but if one looks at this situation, the fulfilment of the condition is necessarily going to take place after release. So control will be asserted over the body and the release secured before that condition can be fulfilled. Yes, but you've got to agree in advance to fulfil the condition, otherwise... Yes. AANES won't release the that, That's true. And, but and, it and is no one's nonetheless going to open the gate unless the consular official and his team are standing there to receive the prisoner. But it is nonetheless true that that is what is necessary in any event to fulfil the conditions of the writ. And that's what distinguishes this situation from a situation where other, in, other conditions are entailed. <coughs> that is part so and parcel of. Uh, it's, it's part and parcel of what is required to. Uh, fulfill the obligations imposed by the writ. So this formulation <coughs> avoids any need to distinguish between different sorts of conditions, apart from the very particular condition in this case. So it, your answer would have to be that if they said um, uh, uh, relief, we, if the hostage takers said um, we will uh, release this British citizen on payment of £100, your answer would be that uh, it was still not in their control. Uh, and the condition might be quite innocuous and very easy to fulfil and not raise any difficulties of principle, but you would still say um, that uh, the mere presence of the condition uh, meant that uh, the uh, 
UK government didn't have control. The requisite power did not exist. Can I then hand up the uh, the writ, uh, or, or rather a pro forma <coughs> writ, just to show that it does require the production of the body at the court? a useful exercise just to see how um, this would be phrased if you um, succeeded. It would be addressed to the um, Foreign Secretary, presumably. Um, the rest and custody would be appropriate because it might be constructive custody, but it was nevertheless the court would have held custody. And what would the date and time specified be? Well, that would be dependent, and it, would, it could be moved again, the return date, but it would be dependent on when practically the measures could be taken to produce the body before so the... The way it would work would be the court would say, in principle, we're with you, uh, uh, and uh, that would then be a debate with the Secretary of State as to how soon, how, what, how long such arrangements would take. The Secretary of State would no doubt say, well, you can't really know until you've tried. My best guess is X weeks, months even. And we would say, um, all right, X weeks, and you can come back if it turns out to be more difficult than you thought. Yes. And, and the court would obviously have its, its, its eye on making the period as short as possible, as practically possible. And if in the event it proved impossible in that, in that time scale, then the respondent could come back to the court and explain the steps that have been taken and a new date could be fixed. And that's precisely what happened in Ramatullah. But, it, but isn't the premise of this, Rick, that the Secretary of State or the Secretary of State's <coughs> agent has taken and detained the person into his or her custody? and then has to explain why the Secretary of State and, or his or her agent has taken and detained <coughs> the person. Well, this is, this is um, my lady, this is a pro forma. And yeah. it, there are many different circumstances in which um, the writ might run. And it would obviously be inappropriate for this wording to have been used, for example, in relation to Mr. Ramatullah. We don't have the writ in Mr. Ramatullah's case. But a writ was issued in which he was not currently, uh, in respect of which he was not currently in the detention of the United Kingdom. Well, that's why well, I well, well, why would there be any difference? Well, Sorry. when I asked the question, I said that the Secretary of State or the Secretary of State's agent. So the Secretary of State could have said, well, you know, if, if, the Secretary, um, if the United States is my agent, this is how he came into... Because in that case, the Secretary of State did take and detain Ramatullah into custody um, and then transferred him to the United <coughs> States. So seems to me the writ is more appropriate on those sorts of facts than, than here. May, may I simply observe this, that this is, a, this is a document that has been drafted in light of um, the drafter's appreciation <coughs> of whatever authorities on the writ of habeas corpus the drafter um, was considering at the time. I, 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 in my submission, one cannot read from this back to what the status of the law of control is in relation to Hayes. Okay. And so, so the pro forma writ's wrong. I mean, it, well, it, it's, as I, mean, with I just many, want to know if that's your submission. A, a, as with many such pro forma documents, they are adaptable to the particular circumstances. <coughs> okay. And um, what is right here, what is applicable here, is that the writ requires the production of the body. But the but circumstances you, to which that writ has application may be such that 
it, it is not appropriate to talk of um, the uh, the agent or the custodian, um, the physical custodian, being uh, the respondent or an agent of the respondent. Well, I think you could say one of two things. You'd either have to say um, the words taken and would have to come out because the Secretary of State had never taken uh, <coughs> your clients uh, <coughs> under his custody. Or you could say, well, it's a little bit clumsy, but in fact, as from the moment that uh, they acquired control <coughs> as a result of the offer, uh, that was in effect a taking. Yes. And also but custody includes construct constructive custody. So being taken and detained under your custody. So no, but that wouldn't work. Exactly if taking refers to the initial stage, does, when they were taken into custody, there was no element of constructive custody. The constructive custody has only arisen on your case at the moment of the offer. Yes. So, I mean, speaking for myself, it seems to me the language obviously isn't appropriate. You either had to change the, change the language or say <coughs> that um, it could be given a special, rather awkward meaning to suit the circumstances yes. of the present case. But you say ultimately the words don't the words should not be determinative the word, of the substance. The words can't govern the substance. And that's, that's, well, no, that's maybe, the but they do, they are at least relevant as showing the um, historical origin. These are, these are obviously words go back a long way. Uh, and the historical <coughs> origin showing the circumstances in which it was thought the writ would run. Namely, that you've been taken into custody by the uh, person to whom the writ is directed. Yes, and, and what we see in the authorities is that the historical origins have undergone um, huge change and the writ has developed, expanded. Well, you were going to say that. You haven't shown us that yet. Uh, well, what I, what I certainly show uh, you... No, I didn't... I didn't I, I'm not going to produce any authorities that show that there is a non-detention case, a case where the... UK no, but you haven't even shown us that the writ has undergone great adaptations in early <clears> days. Well, the adaptation it has gone, undergone since early days arises through cases such as O'Brien, Bernardo, and then Ramatullah. Now, the fact that those are also cases in which <coughs> there was a detention is, in our submission, um, it, 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 it is, is a matter of fact that is factually accurate. But you don't, from that, um, draw the conclusion that it can only ever arise in those circumstances, because what those authorities demonstrate is that the writ is adaptable to changing circumstances and conditions, and ultimately it is a question of whether the writ should run in the circumstances. And to lay down jurisdictional bars, such as that there must have been prior custody, is a dangerous path to take. I want to develop this further when I come to our supplementary case. But for present purposes, this is still our argument that the fact that there have been these features in the past in all these cases does not make those features either, or, or something <coughs> akin to them, either actually necessary in order to establish control or jurisdictionally necessary. That's our primary case. And I will come in our secondary case to develop the argument about why, insofar as this court feels that there are features in addition to the de facto power to secure release that must be present before the jurisdiction can be exercised, um, then those features are not ones which any court should lay down in stone as jurisdictional preconditions, but they are simply features of something of a more general description. But I will come to that um, later if I may. So, <coughs> can, can we just before we move on? I'm sorry to interrupt you, but can we, can we just be clear? Um, if a, a, a consular official and team went to the gates of the camp and, and received the appellant, um, as from that moment onwards, is it your case that they would be under the control? of the consular official 
Yes. Or she would have what the power to arrest them if they tried to run off or, or something like that. What, well, what power they would have would exercised, exercised the power over their detention. That's the well, no, they'd exercised purpose the power the to, to secure release. Yes, and that is but, the but power that, over from their that moment detention. on. But from from that moment on, what 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 what's the relationship between the consular official and the appellant? <coughs> so, as my lady has suggested, the the the, the premise of the writ. <coughs> Appear to be that someone who is detaining a person against their will is required to submit that person to the court so that the court can determine whether there be any lawful justification for the detention. And, and, and I just wonder how that works in what's effectively a collusive arrangement. But that would have been precisely <coughs> the same position in relation to Ramatullah. What basis, once he was released, would there be for the UK to detain him? Well, I'm not sure release. about that. The U no, the uh, <coughs> UK had originally detained him. Yes. If he was handed <coughs> back, <coughs> prima facie, he would have the same status as he had when he was handed over to the Americans. So he would go from the, he would, it would clearly be back into a custody arrangement. Well, this would be 10 years later, after he was originally detained, in fundamentally different circumstances, there would have to be an assessment immediately of the justification for detention and whether there was any justification yeah. well, it, it, for it, it, that detention. And, 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 and that is certainly not <coughs> something that follows from the fact that he was detained 10 years earlier, because his detention in the first instance was on grounds of imperative... Well, what, what would have happened if he had been returned to the British and they had said, um, uh, OK, we don't want you anymore, and he had been cast loose in Iraq, would he have been happy? Uh, his, would he have been happy? Yes. Um, we don't know. I think he wanted to come back to the UK, didn't he? No. No, he's Pakistani. No, but I. No, he has never come back to the UK. Uh, he did. He want. I, I, we'd have to remind no, ourselves of the no, facts. No, 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 no. He is in. He's in Pakistan. That's where he went upon his uh, ultimate release. He went to Pakistan. He, he's. He doesn't. He's okay, so let's people. just play out how it would have happened. One of two things would have happened. The Ameri <coughs> the Americans would have returned him to the UK authorities. They would either have redetained him. Didn't argue about whether it would have been a rev revival of the previous detention or a redetention, but they would, they would, he would have been in detention from the moment of return, in which case the uh, writ would have required the production of his body in London, so he would have been flown to London. Or they would have said, We're not interested in detaining you anymore, in which case uh, he uh, would then have to make his own arrangements to get back to Pakistan from Iraq. Um, that's the correct analysis, is it? Yes, and then he would... And there, there wouldn't have been any required to make a return to the writ, or perhaps there, formerly there would have been required to make a return to the writ, which would have been that the Secretary of State would have turned up at the law courts on the, on the day and said, um, we haven't brought the body because we've released him. Yes. The peculiarity of this case is that nobody wants... <laughs> Your client positively wants to be repatriated. Yes. She would not be happy if she were um, uh, released in whichever neighbouring country. Well, she might prefer to be brought back here, but if she were released in a neighbouring country, she could then make her way back here. Well, no, she, she couldn't. Be... She couldn't without without travel documents. Well, she she could. She has a right of abode in this country. So to refuse her travel documents, to enable her to, well, to make her way back here, would not be open to the well, Secretary of State. Well, I, I, I see that, and in a sense, that this is quite a useful exchange, because isn't that, in, in a sense, what this is about? It's about whether she should be, the Secretary of State should be compelled to give her travel documents no. to bring her back here. 
no, that's, that's not what this is about. Well, one of the consequences of the issue of the writ is that the Secretary of State would be required to give her travel documents to bring to, to come back here. Yes, that is a consequence of the issue well, now, of the writ, but that's not... I don't want to take you... Uh, I would quite like to understand how that works. Let, let, let us suppose that uh, the uh, consular officials uh, attended um, the camp, obtained her release, took her to a neighbouring country, uh, and then, either in breach of any undertaking given to AANES or because AANES made it clear they didn't mind if he was released as long as it wasn't in Syria, um, <coughs> said, OK, you're on your own. Uh, and let's assume the neighbouring country was one where there was a diplomatic mission. So she makes her way to, um, not to tread on any sensitivities, but Dad, it could be Ankara, it could be no doubt one to other countries, and uh, appeared at the embassy or consulate there and said, um, I want to, uh, um, I want my passport effectively. My passport's expired or I haven't got it. Um, and they said, uh, No, we know they won't. We don't want you back because of national security. Would she have an absolute right to it? Could proceedings be brought in the High Court here yes. for mandamus exactly. to issue a... Exactly that. Because absolute security, right? Absolutely. And we'll look. We will look at the authorities on this. But okay. she has an absolute right to re-enter a country where she has a right of abode which has been described as constitutional. So... Hang on one second. Uh, hang on one second. So, this phrase consular assistance, which is used by the Secretary of State in a rather um, generic sense, you would say that might be an appropriate description of um, some of the things that consuls do, helping people when they're in legal proceedings or in hospital, or um, uh, maybe even be an appropriate description of the, of the business of getting her out of the camp. But it, it, you... There, the issue of a passport or appropriate travel documents um, to enable her return to the UK would not be, in any real sense, consular assistance. No. It would be an absolute right. No. That is an exercise or, or, okay. or something required to be done in exercise of her right. By contrast, ordinarily, absent um, uh, the particular circumstances that obtain here, the Secretary of State requesting the release would be an act of consular assistance, like in Abbasid. And that would be a persuasion case, but this is not such a case. Well, I don't think we need... Uh, as long as we know what positive acts we're talking about, I think the label of consular assistance perhaps may be more confusing than, yes. than helpful. Yes. <laughs> so um, that, that completes the, the review of the authorities. I was going to summarise um, but I, what... what we submit as established by the authorities, but I think you have our case on that. But I do just want to draw a distinction between <coughs> the persuasion cases and a case where there is control sufficient for the writ to, uh, to issue. So control requires more than the ability to persuade. And that's so even if the circumstances are such that the respondent can be expected to be able to exercise considerable influence. So control <coughs> denotes a set of circumstances in which it is possible to say before a request for release is made that a decision by the respondent to secure the release... Sorry, if, you're, if you wanted to write this down, you just do it a bit slower. A set of circumstances which is possible to say before a request is made that a decision by the respondent to secure the release of the applicant by making such a request 
will be given effect by the actual detainer? And that's a factual question. And it can be that the answer lies in the fact that there is an already existing obligation, whether it be one imposed in international law, not enforceable, or by way of a mutual agreement, or, as arises in this situation, by a unilateral offer by the detainer himself. And then the question <coughs> for the court in deciding whether or not to issue the writ is, is whether or not it is satisfied that control then exists. Or it may be that the factual circumstances are such that it's not clear whether the detainer will respond to that request. And so that has to be examined. That was the Ramatullah case. Uh, in our submission, there is, and we'll look at it um, in relation to our supplementary argument. No, we'll, we'll look at it now, I'm sorry. There is ample evidence to say that the detainer will release upon a request being made. So we have, firstly, the clear and unequivocal statement by the AANES that it will release the applicants, at the appellants, to the United Kingdom <coughs> if it makes an official request and, in brackets, agrees to repatriate. That statement has been made in circumstances where the AA NES has made its position plain repeatedly that it does not want itself to detain the women. There is a huge body of evidence. I, I, I don't want to cut you short on this. I, I don't get the impression that Mr. Jameson, tell us I've got this wrong, that it is disputed that the AANES have said, and there is no reason to doubt, that if an official request is made, coupled with a uh, undertaking to repatriate, uh, that they will do so. I don't want to put you on your, uh, put you in a difficult position, Mr. James, but is, is that in dispute? Well, I think put in that way it isn't, but you'll appreciate there are various conditions attached to all of this. Yeah, oh yes, but I think, well perhaps it's always a mistake for the court to try and slow the states. To, to speed things up. <coughs> give, give us, give us your, your remaining evidence, but it, um, but you can take it quite quickly because yes. we've read it all. We know what so it they don't want to detain. There is already a, a very significant amount of evidence um, uh, that the AANES has stood by its promises made both to the United Kingdom and to many many other countries throughout the world um, uh, by releasing women who those countries have agreed to repatriate. Um, uh, they being yep. citizens of those countries. Yep. And um, that's also relevant because it shows the practicality, <coughs> the practicability of uh, repatriation. So th those really are, in summary, the reasons why we say this is a case <coughs> where if the court is satisfied that there is control in whatever the requisite sense uh, of the term is, um, then this isn't a case where the writ needs to be issued in order to test that question. The writ needs to be issued and that the respondent needs to be directed to uh, give effect to the control that uh, he unquestionably has. Can I turn then to the divisional court's judgment and as to why we submit the divisional court has erred? <coughs> so paragraph 37 is where I'd like to start, and that's the core bundle, page 82. Can I ask the court to read paragraphs 37 through to 39?
Yes. So we see that initially um, the Secretary of State was putting the case on the basis that there are some clear jurisdictional bars, and the first is in relation to, to features of the circumstances in which the individual came to be detained. And there is the jurisdictional bar that will apply if they haven't been in the detention of the respondent at some point and no civil wrong has been committed. And then you'll see that the court <coughs> didn't agree to take that approach. And in that respect, we submit that the court was correct. And then you'll also see at 39 that Sir James um, also rode back from that approach. And he then said, these sorts of factors are all aspects of control. So not jurisdictional bars, but they are relevant to the assessment of control. Um, having then reviewed the trilogy of cases, Bernardo, <coughs> O'Brien, and Ramatulla, the court then held, and we again submit rightly, at paragraphs 87 to 88, and consistently with the approach we've seen, we've seen set out in paragraph 38, just there, that there was no legal requirement, or there is no legal requirement, that the UK had actual custody at some point, or that there must be a prior arrangement which would just could justify that the reasonable belief that the latter. Was sorry, I, I haven't. Let me. This is eighty-seven and eighty-eight. Yes, I, I'm. I'm sorry. I should just let you read it and be quiet. So again, these are not <coughs> defining requirements, they are features of the case, sorry, they are not um, preconditions, but they were defining features of those cases uh, for the purposes of control. So again... But he's sort of slightly hedging his bets, isn't he? Well, it's not necessarily a complete answer. It may be advancing the step too far. <coughs> I'd hesitate before deciding that, so I'm, I'm not sure he's sure he's nailing his colours to a particular mast, is he? Well, uh, uh, our <coughs> own reading is that ultimately, despite saying that a flexible approach has to be taken and that there should not be rigid preconditions laid down, um, if one then reads the reasons uh, for why, uh, starting at paragraph 91, yeah. uh, he rejects the applicant's case, um, it does seem to be is actually laying down rigid but, but surely all he's doing, well, I don't know, one possible reading of 87 and 88 is that he's saying, well, I'm keeping an open mind about these points and let's see where we get to. That, that may be one reading. I mean, ultimately, right. ultimately um, <coughs> he does appear to have laid down rigid requirements, and we, we submit in so doing, he has erred, or the court has erred, because this was the uh, approach adopted also by Lord Justice Lewis. Can I take the court then down into the heart of the reasoning as to why the applicant's face, case fails? It starts at, uh, there is a, a, a Firstly, the starting point is it would amount to an unworkable and unprincipled extension of the writ. And then three reasons are given, starting at 91, for rejecting the case. And if I can ask the court again, we can look at 91 to 94, but it would help if the court could just read those quickly again.
my suspicion what, what lies at the heart of the reasoning is there at paragraph 94. And it appears that the court is there holding that control can only be established if the respondent has, and I use their words, dominion over the power to release. In other words, that the power to release is something that is voluntarily acquired by the respondent. Or, in other cases, so this is, this is our case, they're looking at the unilateral offer and saying that's not something that is capable of giving rise to control <coughs> because there is no dominion over the uh, acquisition of the power to release. So it's, it's a voluntary acquisition alone by way of, for example, a bilateral agreement. They're not dealing here with other possible <coughs> preconditions, such as uh, the imposition of some sort of obligation or duty, such as the uh, as, as the Geneva Convention. They're only dealing specifically with uh, circumstances where there is, uh, by reason of an offer, um, uh, the question of whether power and control over the body has been acquired. So the reason the court reaches that <coughs> conclusion is that it says otherwise it is a situation in which the piper is calling the tune. Now, if we put aside imposing other conditions, which we have done at the start of this morning's hearing, and we are simply dealing with a situation in which the detainer offers to release, <coughs> What is the principal distinction between the two situations, where there's a bilateral agreement and where there is merely an offer? Why is there control in a situation where before detention, the defendant agrees with the respondent that if you ask us to hand over A, we will, and after detention, D comes along and says to R, we will release, his, release this individual if you request us to do so. There is control, in fact, in both situations over the continued detention. In particular, the point made that by the divisional court that in that situation, it's open to the detainer to <coughs> change the conditions or change the offer at any point in time is not either a point of distinction because that remains the position even where there's a bilateral agreement. It all comes down in the end to a question of fact as to whether or not the <coughs> offer or the agreement is going to be honoured or resiled from with additional conditions are being imposed by the detainer. If those additional conditions are imposed, then there is no control. But the question of whether there's control is one that has to be answered at the point at which the issue is being considered. So if there is simply, as there is at this point in time, an offer to release, then there is in our submission no principal distinction whatsoever between the situation of a bilateral agreement and that which arises here. And we do submit, therefore, that, that what the divisional court has done is, and I, I take my lady's point, maybe there isn't a contradiction in this judgment, but it, it did seem to us that there was. It, it, it seemed to us that it had resiled from its position of saying there shouldn't be rigid uh, conditions or jurisdictional prerequisites for the existence of control. But it does appear to have made it a condition of the writ of habeas issuing that in, and there may be other conditions as well, such as detention to which my Lord Lord Justice Underhill will um, refer, but it appears to have made it a condition um, that the power, if there is a power, uh, acquired by way of some form of offer, is acquired voluntarily in the form of a, a, a bilateral agreement. And we submit that that is inconsistent with the authorities and unprincipled. Can I turn then to the second um, concern or reason 
at why the court refused to issue the writ, uh, uh, dismiss the applicant's application. And that's that's 96 to 98 of the judgment. And can I again just ask the court to read those passages? So I, I think I've pretty well answered that point already, that um, if, in order, if control is established, then the practical difficulties are not factors which, one, undermine control, and secondly, would justify the court in saying, we won't issue the writ because this cannot be effective the return of the body speedily. That would be completely contrary to the very object and purpose of the writ, which is to secure that individuals who are unlawfully detained by respondents who have control over them are released. So, But I think you're, you're not meeting, you're saying if control is established. Then these are being advanced by Mr Justice Jay as reasons why control isn't established. Yes, and that well, the answer to that is that these, it is the matter that we've already addressed before, which is that the, the, the position of the Secretary of State in not wanting to uh, give effect to the requirements of the writ, which are to bring the body person back before the court. No, but that's not the point at all. The po Those are in themselves perfectly good points, but they don't meet the actual reasoning. The actual reasoning is that what you're presenting as a simple offer without any relevant condition, um, can be accepted. What Ms. Justice Jay is saying is, no, that's not the case. Well, you actually have to enter into a diplomatic process with a, a NES, going beyond just saying, yes, and we'll be there on Friday with a Land Rover. And, and I suppose I should say that I've addressed it already in, in what I said at the beginning of this morning's session, which is that those are aspects of securing with the writ. That's exactly what the Supreme Court in Ramatullah said were the sorts of considerations that could not be invoked to prevent the issue of the writ. The fact that there will be diplomatic steps to take, that is, asking for the individual to be released, that is a di diplomatic move. Well, Just speaking of myself, if that was all that was being said, I would be inclined to agree with you and um, but it's clear that Mr Justice Jay didn't simply have in mind the writing of the letter saying thank you yes he uh, had in mind uh, the uh, detailed arrangements that would have to be made um, which he regards as going to control not as going to um, simply practical performance yes and in my submission... You think that's a wrong, wrong analysis? He is wrong to consider that that goes to control, because... What about... Oh, sorry, <coughs> your sentence. Because those features are features of giving effect to the writ. Yeah, well, that's what you say. I yes, and they, and they are not aspects of going to the question of whether there is control. Control is established by the fact that a request is what is required to secure the release. Yes, OK, I see that. Um, this isn't quite how Mr. Justice Jay puts it, uh, although he does refer to the totality of Mr. Hardwick's evidence. But Mr. Hardwick's evidence goes beyond saying we'd have to make arrangements with AANES. Also says we would have to make arrangements with the neighbouring country, whichever it was, which would be very sensitive to our bringing through it what they might see as um, a dangerous um, detained person. And uh, we would have to 
make arrangements of a diplomatic nature. They will most certainly, for example, the neighboring country would have to provide an escort uh, and, 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 and all of that. Um, that is not something that's in your control to achieve, something you can do your best to achieve. But if the neighboring country says no, don't care if you turn up at the, at the, at the border crossing with um, C3 and C4 in the back of your Land Rover and say, can we come across to take, take, to take them to the airport? Well, we'll say no. So two, two points on that. Firstly, there is no distinction in principle between those consular moves that have to be um, undertaken to give effect to the issue of the writ, which requires the body to be brought back, and the making of a request, for example, trying to well, there is a distinction which is because a, you're dependent on a third party. No, 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 no difference in principle so far as this is a consular move, and the, the position of uh, the Secretary of State is non-justiciable. That's not something you can look at. So, no, no difference in principle on that. No difference either in our submission, or rather, not, not such as to defeat the issue of the writ. Um, the fact that you have to ask a third party. But because those, again, are all matters that simply go to giving effect to... No, that can't be right. <coughs> it may be that you've it, come it, back it, to it, 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 is, it is true but that this, this point is not looked at in any of the authorities, but that's because, it, which may be a point against you, this situation has never arisen in any of the authorities. But in principle, if you're going to say that it's enough you can show that in practice you can affect the release. You've also got to show that you have power to do the second thing you've got to do, which is um, bring them to uh, Britain and to the High Court. And if you don't have power to do that, let us suppose the facts were that AANES um, had said, we're very willing to release, provided you get her out of the country. And uh, it were perfectly clear that all the neighbouring countries said, uh, we will not offer transit. Um, the logic of your position is, I think, that, oh, never mind, you still have control because you can um, get her out of the camp. But that's only part of what you're required by the RIP to do. If it is clear that you cannot uh, bring her to this country, to what your RIP's been required to do, then you don't have control in the normal sense. So, so the RIP... The sorry, in the, don't have control in the, in the relevant sense. So the RIP would issue, the Secretary of State would go about trying to secure the conditions that would enable him to bring them back, and if obstacles are confronted along the way, then at that point, either... The decision can be made to release them wherever they are, and they've gone as far as possible to secure the fulfilment of the terms of the writ, or the matter comes back to court, and the court decides whether or not, in light of that practical impossibility, um, they are themselves unable to fulfil the obligation of the writ to bring the body before the court. That is a question of fact that will depend upon the circumstances as they unfold. And that would bring the case more closely into an O'Brien situation. But we don't have evidence here that says we can't do this because there are these practical difficulties that, that, that are in, insurmountable. And we know that's not the case because it, it, it's happened before. It has been done. And it's been done repeatedly with many, many other countries. Yeah, thank you. So, and, and, and so can I also submit that, that, that the Court of Appeal was wrong then to treat this case as no different from a persuasion case? When you say the Court of Appeal, you mean the Divisional Court? Sorry, did I say? <laughs> yes, the Divisional Court. I've written this. The Divisional Court was wrong to conclude that this case is no different from a persuasion case because the Secretary of State is being compelled to engage in a diplomatic exercise. 
isn't what makes this a persuasion case. What makes this a persuasion case is where all that can be achieved in relation to the detainer <coughs> is to ask them, without any reason to, uh, 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 of obligation or otherwise, to be able to conclude that they will consider themselves under an obligation to give effect to your request. That's what distinguishes a persuasion case uh, from, uh, or rather, that is what distinguishes this case and the other cases from persuasion cases, where all you can do is ask, even if you have a great deal of influence. This case is, is no different from the trilogy of cases, for the reasons I've already addressed, of O'Brien, uh, Bernardo, and Ramatulla, because it is clear on the evidence that the defendant, having made the offer and having acted in the way that it has done, will release if a request is made. Before we move on, <coughs> may, may I just clarify one point, if you please? Um, a, a short while ago, you were um, <coughs> dictating, um, really, if I may say so, rather briskly, <laughs> your formula. And uh, what I wrote down was a set of circumstances in which it is possible to say before a request for release is made that a decision by the respondent to secure release by making such a request will be given effect by the detainer. Sh sh should the word unconditionally be included in, in that formulation, will unconditionally be given effect? Yes, subject to what I've already said about the condition imposed in this case. Yeah. Um, Thank you. And if I didn't add that, 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 that it, yes, no, I, I think that suffices. So on to the third part, or the third reason for the objection of the discovery, <coughs> that's a paragraph... 99 and the first sentence of 100. <coughs> I think 101 really goes with. with uh, sorry, and 101, I'm so sorry, yeah. <coughs> right down to 102. And again, I think I, I, I have addressed this point already isn't an Abassi case. Well, you haven't taken us to Abassi. Well, I know, I'm sure Mr. Uh, Sir James is going to take you to Abassi, I would have thought so, but, but if I can just out, outline the essential difference between Abassi and this case. In the case of Abassi, um, there had been no indication on the part of the United States that it would release upon request. The circumstances were such that what the applicant wanted in that case was for the Secretary of State to make a request or to make diplomatic moves to try to persuade uh, the Americans to release. But there had been no offer or otherwise on the part of uh, the Americans to do so. so. So clearly a pure persuasion case where all that could be done should uh, such a request be made would be to seek to persuade, to seek to influence. So that is, for the reasons I have given, a very distinct situation to, what, to the one that confronts the court in relation to the appellant, where there is a clear offer and for the reasons I've advanced, a basis, a strong, compelling basis on which to conclude that having made that offer, having made its position plain in relation to uh, its own desire not to detain these individuals, and having released them, released others in multiple situations, the defendant will treat that request as something it is obliged to comply with. Sorry, the defendant or Sorry, the, AA detainer, AA. the detainer. So, for those reasons, we, we submit that 
the divisional court erred in the reasons it well, gave. Well, you haven't dealt with the point made at 100 and 101, which is that the correct approach in a case of this kind, I appreciate the points are overlap, but is um, to seek judicial review of the refusal um, uh, to both take the necessary steps to secure release and, which is of fundamental importance to your client, to issue travel documents um, uh, so that they can be repatriated. And I note that consistently with what you said, but we haven't seen any authority about this, um, Mr. Justice Jay says in, uh, in um, paragraph 101 that the Secretary of State couldn't refuse a travel document on national security grounds if they presented mm. themselves at the nearest British consulate. Yes. So I, I apologise if the court thinks I haven't, haven't dealt with this. The answer to this is the matters about which um, Mr Justice Jay was saying the appropriate course is to seek judicial review is the refusal to repatriate and to issue travel documents. Our case is... No, I'm the, sorry, in a sense you've dealt with it, of course, because your case is this fits habeas corpus for all the reasons you've given. And, the, and, and therefore you don't need judicial review. It but I'm, I'm interested in, nevertheless, the, the suggestion that judicial review is, in fact, a more appropriate uh, remedy. If, if we're being asked to make new law <coughs> um, and extend the scope of habeas corpus, you would say on a principled basis, but nevertheless beyond any case in which it's been established before, um, which is, uh, then we need to think about uh, whether that isn't better done, particularly with the recent development of judicial review. I mean, habeas corpus goes back <coughs> many centuries. Judicial review in its current form is a creature largely of the last 50 years. I mean, legal historians would disagree with that because there are many origins for it. But if you were making up the law now, you might well say that the kinds of decisions that really are the problem for you here are more appropriately dealt with by the more flexible route of judicial review. So can I, can I deal with that in two stages then? At this current point in time in our argument, our primary case is that the conditions for, um, the conditions by which the power to determine the release arise is satisfied as the authorities stand at the moment. It's not necessary to develop the law at no, all. Okay. If I... that is the case, then it necessarily follows, see paragraph 70 to 74 of, of the judgment of Lord Kerr, that all these issues that might be yep. reviewed by the court by way of judicial review simply do not arise for <coughs> consideration. Okay, I've got that. Okay, that's argument number one. And then that question is one that the court might think about when I come on to our supplementary case. Our case is that even if it is, in some sense, or, or, or we are wrong on our primary case, and it's necessary to look at what are the further features of these cases that make it appropriate to issue the writ, um, do we fit within that, or is this a judicial review case? And that's really the question that you're going to be asking me. Our position is what those cases encapsulate is a reason to issue the writ that rests, or, or, or a definition of control that rests both on the factual power to secure release and a responsibility to do so. And that is what we submit encapsulates the cases that have come before. That is what we submit is an appropriate general set of principles to ensure that the writ is not unduly constrained for the future. And if we're right about that, then again, this would fall in the uh, Lord Kerr, paragraph 70 to 74 side uh, 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 of the fence, rather than judicial review. But that's something that, that, that <coughs> your Lordship will consider as I take your Lordship through okay. our arguments. Can you just help me on this? Uh, I, I'm not surprised by this proposition. Um, but is there 
on, on what authority did Miss Justice Jay say the Secretary of State couldn't refuse a travel document on national security grounds? So let, let me take you to to the authorities on that. Um, the first is Banco, I think. Yeah, the first is, is the judgment of Lord Hoffman in Banco, number two, um, and that is tab nine. And if uh, your lordship turns uh, uh, and, and my lord and my lady turn to page 317, uh, paragraphs 43 44. Sorry, no, paragraph 42 down to 44. And if the court reads those. Sorry, I'm just. So uh, page 317 of the authorities, tab 9. Just give me a second. Which part? Of the, 42 the, down to 44. Okay, thank you. I'm going to take, take the court to a few passages in this judgment. Yeah, well, I got, I got the then, sideline 42 to 44, not surprising. And then paragraph 70 in the judgment of Lord Bingham. So sorry, I missed that. That's second. paragraph 70, page 70. Thank you. 3, no, 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 2, fine. I'll, I'll find it. But do we need to read all that? This is all about the exile, and I, I imagine you're going to say the corollary of that is you must allow people to come back. Yes. But, but we where's the see, corollary drawn? It, it, we can see here, at, uh, between F and G, part of what's cited, Mr. Fender further observes, a significant number of modern national constitutions characterise the right to enter one's own country as a fundamental human right, and a long list is given. Um, then Lord <coughs> Roger... This is the Che Gossian's case. It is. It is. Well, 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 I can't, I mean, there's been so much of this litigation, I, I can't remember which bit is which. Was this actually about them? This was they wanting to go back yeah, to, to the Che Islands. It wasn't about coming to the UK. No, no, no. no. It was about wanting to go back because they were. Yeah, no, I, I, I know the general background, but I just wasn't sure what the particular issue was. So, at, at, at 86, Mr. Crow did not argue that Chapter 29 of Magna Carta was not applicable or suitable to the circumstances of Biot, so I proceed on the basis that it applies and that no one can be exiled from Biot but by the law <coughs> land. And then at 88, although not cited by counsel, there are two other passages which might tend to support the view that the right not to be banished from the British economy yeah, is I, fundamental. I, I, this, this is the easy bit. Uh, where's the bit where they say under corollaries, if you voluntarily go abroad, you can't, can't you, you? You have the absolute right to come back. It's Bingham in seventy. We looked at it. Didn't uh, did we? we? Sorry. Well, I uh, forgive me. Yes. Uh, show show me the exact, the exact passage. bit. So. No. Well, you, you showed me a bit saying Dr. Principle Pender. Principle that every state must admit its own nationals to its territory is accepted so widely that its existence is, as a rule of law, virtually beyond dispute. That's in the quoted passage from Lord Justice Lords. So if. if oh, I'm sorry. Well, just show me. Uh, I'm sure you're right. But you're rushing us through this. Wh I'm sorry. Which, between which letters? So, if we look at between C and D, before we get to the quoted passage... There oh, is I see. Now, I've got it now. I've got it now. I've got it now. The Crown has never had a project about to prevent its subjects from entering the, king, to, entering the kingdom or to expel them from it. Um, um, and then, uh, <clears throat> from Dr. Plender's he then was um, principal every state has admitted its own national first you don't dispute. Thank you. Okay, I've got it now. Okay, and, and then uh, just for your lordship's pen then, uh, Lord Roger, paragraph 88, that is speaking about being exiled, Carswell at 1, 2, 3, 2, 4, Lord Carswell. Um, Hang on. Again, discussing being banished, and then Lord Mance at one five one. Okay, you, 
that, that's, um, that's that that's plenty. I I um. And there's also just for your for for the court's notes the case of Komachowski, which is at tab thirteen. And the judgment of Lord Mance. Hang on one second. Between D and E on in paragraph thirty one, page four eight one, and that does make reference to entry. Yep. And Lady Hale's judgment at page paragraph forty nine, similarly. Yeah. So, can I turn to our supplementary notes and um, ask that the court... Can I just ask one more question about judicial review? Um, there are various points in the Secretary of State's skeleton which give the impression, not all they state in terms, that you were told you ought, uh, from the start you ought to proceed by way of judicial review, but you chose not to. Uh, is, is that accepted? I've had a quick look at the um, pre-action protocol letters and I haven't seen that quite said explicitly. Clearly a, clearly a considered decision was made to go by habeas corpus rather than judicial. Yes. Um, but, um, well, perhaps we, you can deal with this in reply if Sir James points to a particular passage which says, look, you would, this is what you ought to do. <coughs> You'll fail, but this is your, this is your correct route. Yes, and our, and our position is we've taken the correct route. Yeah. But of course, the okay. court has the power under Order 87 to treat the case as a judicial review should it decide to do so. So, but yeah. we nonetheless. Um, so, there, and there aren't any issues about <coughs> time limit because we issued in a very very short time scale. From oh, sorry, just say that last bit again. You say we have the power to treat this as a as, as, a, judicial. as a judicial review under Order 87. But we submit that that is not necessary or appropriate. So, turning to the supplementary note, um, we didn't address yesterday whether or not the court would hear us on this, the submissions that we made here. Can I, can I just, sorry, can I just follow up, Ms. Calvin, on that? Um, you're not suggesting that we could do that. I mean, it would have to go back and be re heard by the admission court, wouldn't it? I, I would submit that would be the appropriate thing to because do. Because nobody's, nobody's approached us on the basis. No, I wouldn't yeah. invite the court to do no. so. Well, that's not my submission that that is w what should happen, but it would be open to this court to say, yeah. should it reject our case, um, we reject the case, but nonetheless we consider that there are, are there is an argument. But then you'd have to go through the permission stage. And we'd, yeah, or we'd have to go through the permission stage. Yeah. Yeah. All right, thank you. But we, we certainly don't invite the court to do that. Well, I'm sure, of course you don't invite us as the primary no. It's the primary case, but just suppose we were to say, you've chosen the wrong tool here, for reasons which you thoroughly dispute, but suppose we're against you <coughs> on that, this is this claim, the substance of this claim should have been expressed as a judicial review claim, would you in those circumstances as a fallback say we should send it back to the divisional court? Yes, I think we would. Thank you. Sorry, you were about to take us to the sub. Well, uh, I too am afraid to have forgotten exactly where we where we um, uh, uh, left it. I've certainly now had the opportunity to read it. Um, I um, just give me one minute. Well, um, we 
we've now read it. Um, uh, we are all of the view that you should be allowed to advance the arguments in it, um, unless there's objection from Sir James. Oh, we don't object. Thank you. I, I'm grateful, and I'm grateful to Sir James. So this proceeds on the basis that our primary argument is rejected by the court. That is that the factual power of detention uh, is not enough for control, and that Ramatullah and the authorities before it were only decided as they were because of additional features in those cases. And we submit that in that event, in the very unique circumstances of this case, relevant additional features do exist. Okay, can I just pause there and ask you a question? How, you may not know the answer to it, but your state may be best placed to answer it. Do we have a rough idea of how many British citizens there are <coughs> in these camps? I, I'm not able to give a number of those who are British citizens. Right. There are about 60 women, as we understand it, and there'll be many more children. Who were from the oh, UK. 60 women and children. 60 women, 60 and, women children. and children who were from the UK. But s some of those women, if not many, will have been denied <coughs> from British citizenship. So they will be in the... All right, so there are 60 women and children who were from the UK originally, but you don't know what their citizenship no. status is. That's very helpful. So as we've seen, the divisional court, in, in focusing on what was missing in our case, such that the writ should not issue, <coughs> in the course of the judgment, looked at the fact of previous detention and of a pre-existing agreement freely entered into by the respondent, or, as we know from Ramatullah, there was also uh, GC4, Neither convention, so some form of obligation. So there was no obligation in O'Brien, was no. there? And none in Bernardo? No. no. So it's a factual feature. Yeah. We submit is if and in so far as the divisional court did, and it's by no means clear, state that those features should not be treated as necessary requirements for the issue of the writ. We submit that they were correct to do so. And we submit that that is in keeping with the course that the courts have always taken in relation to habeas corpus, which is to maintain its flexibility to change and develop with changing <coughs> circumstances so that it can issue to secure justice in circumstances of unlawful detention and its strength is not diminished or diluted in an unprincipled uh, way. But, but just pausing there, um, what developments do you point to in the case law as, as showing that that's the case? So the developments <coughs> which have seen the writ issue overseas. So when we look at, for example, the um, authority starting um, with um, Mwenya and the question of the effectiveness of the writ, the focus being on whether it's effective. When we look at the case of O'Brien and Bernardo, those cases which first begin to take a very practical approach to the issue of the writ, and then Ramatullah itself. And what's very notable in Ramatullah is I mean, that there the, isn't... The, I, the, it's clear that the allowing the writ to issue in relation to detention overseas is not a novelty at all. It goes that back many centuries. So in, in relation <coughs> to detention by, by or constructive custody? is the point. It's allowing the writ to issue overseas where there is a detainer who is not subject to the 
jurisdiction of this court, <coughs> but there is a constructive custodian who is subject to the jurisdiction of this court, and that is a very, very significant development. And what the court has not sought to do in respect of that development is itself the Supreme Court to lay down expressly as preconditions features of those cases <coughs> in which the writ issue against the custodian, uh, constructive custodian. And in our submission, it would be inappropriate to do so because it could lead to circumstances in which um, the writ will be unable to issue where the justice of the case very much requires it. Can I just give an example? So one example, and this is an example that looks at the issue that's been concerning the court, this court, which is prior detention on the part of the respondent in this jurisdiction. And the case, which I only want to take the court to really just because of the factual circumstances, they indicate the problem that could arise if it was so constrained, it's called Abu Ali, and it is uh, in tab 23, And it was a case before the District of Columbia District Court in 2004, and it arises in relation to the detention of the son of the applicants in Saudi Arabia by the Saudi Arabian. I can ask the court just to read from, in the very first page, the Memorandum of Opinion, and the first column, and then down to the second column, including the first line of the second paragraph in that second column. first fact alleged is that the United States initiated the arrest in Saudi Arabia. Yes, but not physically. They didn't physically detain him. They initiated as in they persuaded him. No, all right. But a, a rendition, I suppose, I may, may have used the wrong term, but it's a rather vague term anyway. If the United States procures a friendly foreign power to arrest someone so that they can then interrogate them, other things to keep them out of mischief. That's a factual situation um, uh, which is in many ways closer to the principle behind habeas corpus uh, than uh, where the uh, United States or the United Kingdom, whichever country, has nothing to do with the initial detention at all. Well, it's, it's it is a factual situation which is perhaps closer to the circumstances in which the writ was originally fashioned, but we're looking at the position now, and what we are hoping to extract <coughs> is a principal basis upon which cases such as this, where one would definitely uh, uh, want to see the power of the writ being exercised by British courts should something like this occur uh, in respect of our own government, even if there has been no detention, no actual detention, <coughs> which has been a feature of all the other cases. So, But the factual allegations in this case, if true, make it a very different case, don't they, than 
No, no, I, I'm not for a moment suggesting this is a case on all fours with our case at all. Right. This is provided as an example of why it is dangerous to be categorical either mm. in stating control requires A, B and C features or there is a jurisdictional bar to uh, the application for a writ, which is, for example, that the, the uh, respondent must have been a detainer at some point in time. One has to be careful to recognise that there are circumstances which are not necessarily readily foreseeable, where the job that the writ does, the purpose that the writ serves, um, are on unquestionably applicable um, to the case. So if the allegations in this case were true, um, would show that the Saudi authorities were detaining um, the um, claimant as um, as agents of the government of the United States. These are stark facts. It's a stark example, but they're detaining them as agents, but the United States is not itself a detainer and never was. So it's necessarily going to be the case that there is an extension <coughs> of the principle that has so far, or rather of the factors that have so far featured in all the cases, which is, as a matter of fact, the respondent has been a detainer and had physical custody at some point in time. It is, it is simply by way of example. <coughs> These are very, very stark facts, no question about it. But it's precisely because there can be such stark cases that it's <coughs> dangerous to lay down any preconditions as opposed to seek principles that can guide decision-making in future cases. Um, can just for the, for the, for the court's note, uh, the, the, the jurisdiction of habeas corpus is obviously very, very different in the United States, where there are statutes that establish um, uh, when the writ can run. But just for the court's note, I don't need to take the, the court to it now, um, uh, page 1274, um, uh, it's instructive to look at the principles that the court runs through in relation to the writ and its historical development. Those principles emphasizing its high purpose and the resulting broad reach and flexibility of the writ. And then at what page 1291, Perhaps worth just reading a citation from the case of Chapman Bay, 1291, on the left hand column, around 48, just a few lines further up. The modern history of Habeas Corpus is a story of steady expansion of the Great Writ. The traditional strict custody requirement has been greatly expanded over the last several years, decades as stifling formalisms and arcane and scholastic procedural requirements have given way. And again, it's just, just to state a note of caution about being unduly prescriptive. <coughs> In our submission, the far better approach is to seek to try and elicit why it is in these cases that in addition to the power that the respondent possessed to secure the release from detention, they should be compelled to do so by the force of the writ. And those cases, as we've seen, are ones where there was prior detention of one instance, or, or as instances in all, the existence of obligations to secure the release, or the voluntary assumption of power to do so. And we submit that what all of these cases have in common is that 
they are ones where the particular factual features of those cases demonstrated or established responsibility on the part of the respondent or the defendant, some form of responsibility for that defendant. And it didn't have to be a legal responsibility. So what's the responsibility for the detention in the present case? Well, can I develop that, my lord? I am going to develop it. And can I just remind the court, before I do so, of what Lord Reid said when he focused on the fact that there was prior detention and said that but for that in this case he would not have been inclined to have found in favour of Mr Ramatullah because what he was looking for was a real or substantial connection with this jurisdiction. Well, I think that in a sense that was a different... It's clear from that that he was on a completely different point. He was on a point about jurisdiction, a real and substantial connection. It's a classic jurisdiction test. So I think that's helpful. It's helpful to you in that it shows he wasn't really concerned with the point that was concerning me, at least. But I don't think you can borrow real and substantial connection because that was directed at a quite separate question. Yes, I can see that. But what there is in these cases, again, if we put real and substantial connection aside, is responsibility. That's what... There is both responsibility and power, and it is those two things together that have led the court to say, you, the respondent, must exercise the power you have and return the body. And in our submission, the court shouldn't go beyond that by way of articulation of the principles that these cases are manifestations of. I didn't note that down. The court should not go beyond... Beyond what? Beyond the articulation of those two governing features. There is responsibility and power as defining the conditions in which the court will issue the writ. I still haven't understood about responsibility. Power, let's assume you've established. Yeah. So what does responsibility add? I thought your case was effective. If you've got the power, you've got the responsibility to exercise it. That's our primary case. So we're now on the second case. Yes, I see. Okay. So we're here because we've lost on that. Yes, okay. So what more is needed that those cases exemplify? So in summary, and I'm then going to take the court through each of these points, we submit that that responsibility exists in the circumstances of these cases. So in brief, point number one, in reality, it is the respondent and the respondent alone who is primarily, if not solely, responsible for the continuation of the detention. Well, that's circular, isn't it? That's simply saying if you don't exercise the power, it will continue. There are many, many factors that we're going to look at together because what is critical is you don't look at each factor in isolation. You look at the question of responsibility as a totality of the factual matrix, as an outcome of the totality of the factual matrix. So the respondent is, in practice, the only person in a position to decide whether the applicants remain in detention or are released. The conditions in which the applicants... Your first point is that one? Yes. Well, is that what you're moving on to second? Yes, the second point. The conditions in which the applicants are detained are also relevant, or the circumstances of their detention. This isn't just an unlawful detention because, for example, some process issue has gone awry. This is a detention for all of them, which not only has endured for four years, but more significantly, 
can endure indefinitely into the future. Entirely arbitrary in that there has been absolutely no process to determine the legality. In circumstances which, and uh, I, I assume from what the court said yesterday, you don't need assistance with this on the facts, but in circumstances which are um, grave breaches of their human rights. But I can... Well, you mean, you mean uh, ignoring any point about um, territorial strip, you mean their Article 3 rights? Yes. yes. Or, or, or their rights under the international covenant. Yes, but you're talking about the conditions in the camp. The right? conditions yeah. in the camp in which they are held. And, and I, I should emphasize as well, as Mr. Squires reminded me, that the, 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 the arbitrary detention to which they're subject, the absence of any due process, the indefinite nature, those are all also breaches of their fundamental rights. Grave, grave breaches. So we have breaches in respect of their detention, and we have breaches in respect of the conditions in which they're detained. Yes, but these are human rights. Just as much human rights. Well, you're not talking about rights under the European Convention. You're talking about under various other international yes. instruments which yes. <coughs> specify his rights. Rights that are recognised by all nations. They are youth cogent, not limited to regional. But they're, vi they're human violations rights. by AANES. They are violations arising from the conditions in which they're being detained, yes. Right. The only reason that they remain in detention is because... Is, the is, is this your... This is my next point, sorry. The third my point. Third. Yeah, yeah. The only reason they remain in detention is because the respondent has decided not to affect their release. Well, that's, that's because, your first point again, isn't it? Beca because... I want oh, to come to sorry. the reason. I'll let you finish because he doesn't want them to return to the United Kingdom for national security reasons. My fourth point is that this is notwithstanding that they have a fundamental constitutional right, which we've just seen, to enter and remain in the United Kingdom. So can I just develop some of those points a little, a little bit more <coughs> in, in substance as to why, in reality, albeit the AANES is the detaining power, has actual physical custody, it is only the respondent that can secure their release. Well, is that right? Because if AANES decided tomorrow to run the gates of the camp, why couldn't they do that? So that, that's what I'm going to come on to. Oh, now. I see. I'm so sorry. So the ANS doesn't want to detain. It hasn't wanted to de detain for a long, long time. It wants these camps to be emptied. It wants all of those who are not <coughs> citizens of Syria to go. Um, it cannot, in our submission, properly or responsibly release the applicants uh, of their own volition, and so it cannot itself bring that unlawful detention to an end. So it's not an it's not a state. It doesn't have power itself to deport those foreign nationals that are detained in the camps. So by contrast, in Turkey, for example, Turkey has deported some individuals who were believed to have been part of. But when you say cannot properly or responsibly release them, what, what norms require AA and ES not to release them? What norms require them? No, well, I'm, not, say I'm not talking here. Or responsibly, I'm not. I'm not talking here in terms of legal constraints. Right. 
absolutely not. I, I make I make it plain. This is not. This is based upon the factual circumstances and looking in the round of the factual circumstances that obtain. So, as a matter of practicality, acting reasonably, the AANES cannot responsibly. Um, well, firstly, it can't default, but secondly, it cannot responsibly release the women into northeastern Syria without more. They have no right to remain in Syria, the, the, the appellants. They have nowhere to live in Syria. They have no means of leaving Syria. And there's no question they would themselves be an obvious and serious risk uh, if they were there. And similarly, if, if it were considered to be the case, and there's no evidence that it is, that they were a risk, they presented a risk, certainly the Secretary of State can say that they do, then again, it's not a responsible course of action to take to release them back into northeastern Syria and the possibility of them disappearing back into ISIS cells and so forth. So it isn't an option available um, reasonably and properly to the AANES. And hence, despite the fact it's made its position absolutely plain that it doesn't want them, it doesn't want to detain them, it is not going <coughs> to release them. The only way to secure their release properly and responsibly is for the UK to repatriate them. Um, that is what the AANS NES has offered to make achievable. So we submit the AA, so the, the respondent is, in reality, the only authority that can reasonably and properly secure their release. But as I've stated, the, the, the reasons for the refusal and the consequences of the refusal to do so, we submit are also relevant to the question of whether or not the respondent has responsibility for their continuing detention such that they should be required to uh, secure their release and repatriate. <coughs> the concern is not one of practicability. It is not one of diplomatic relations. Its concern is exclusively of national security. Now that is the very same concern that led the Secretary of State, the Home Secretary rather, in November 2019 to revoke the citizenship of the applicants. Now that revocation of citizenship was held to be unlawful in March 2021 and their citizenship was reinstated in April of 2021. Not because of any decision either way on the national security aspects, but because it would render them stateless. Absolutely. But the attempt, because of national security concerns, to deprive them of the citizenship failed. And we know, because we've seen it, that those self-same national security concerns cannot justify the Secretary of State in refusing them entry into this country. So what we see is that, in practice, the respondent is, by refusing to secure their release, where they're being held in the appalling conditions in grave breach of their human rights, which he, and only he, can sensibly bring to an end, not only is he consigning them to an indefinite future in those conditions, but in practice, he is banishing them from the United Kingdom by reason only of the fact that they happen to be being held by a non-state actor. Because if they were not held by a non-state actor, they'd be back here. They'd be deported. So by these particular, peculiar, and in our submission, very unique circumstances, the respondent is able to obtain their indefinite exclusion 
from the United Kingdom, notwithstanding that he wasn't able to deprive them of their citizenship, and it was unlawful to have done so, and notwithstanding that he has no right uh, permanently to exclude them. If you say they're not held by a non-state actor, they would be deported. So if they were held, as you've given the example, by Turkey, and they didn't have any travel documents, what would happen? Well, then they would be deported, and then the United Kingdom would be deported to, how? They would go through a deportation process according to Turkish law. And then they would be. They no, would but be uh, issued if they haven't got any travel, I just want to know what would happen. Would, the, the UK would have to issue them as travel documents. It's a matter of international are, law. There, there, there are agreements. You see. Well, I have no idea whether there are or not. That's what I'm asking about. Yes, I think it works on the basis of. Well, we have a problem in this country, the other way round, where we want to remove people to countries which we believe would be nationals um, and the uh, <coughs> embassies refuse to issue travel documents um, and so I was just interested to see actually how it would work uh. you would say you I imagine would say the Turkish authorities would make arrangements for them to attend at the British embassy to be given, tra to be travel, given travel documents travel. at which point we must assume that the British embassy would act in accordance with the law as you've shown us in um, uh, whatever case it was you showed us. Yes, and if it didn't, then it would be possible to judicially review them for refusing yeah, okay. to do that. Well, that's, sorry, that's just I wanted yeah. to think it through. Thank you. Yes, okay, I, I think that, that, yeah, that would no, be the, the answer. Point. Right, now I noticed, I mean... We, we, I, am, I am virtually there. Yeah, okay. I, I, I really am. So, um, so just looking at all those circumstances together, um, our submission is that that unique set of facts um, together uh, renders the United Kingdom responsible for their continuing detention. Is, is, um, <coughs> is responsible being used to mean some sort of obligation, moral, legal, political? Some sort be? of obligation, because it's quite clear that legal is not. Some, legal some sort is of not required, but some a degree of responsibility that this court considers that the power that is possessed by the respondent to secure the release must be exercised. I mean, the label is fine, but the, 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 not, sorry, the, the, lab, the label perhaps isn't, doesn't, isn't really what matters. It's, to me, the kind of points to rely on. <coughs> <coughs> don't look much like responsibility. They just look like other features where justice compels uh, that the court find an appropriate remedy. Habeas corpus is that remedy. I mean, the conditions there have got nothing to do with responsibility. Well, in, in, in our submission, the conditions, the conditions play a part because the more grave the situation they find themselves in, in circumstances where there's only one actor capable of bringing those circumstances. It doesn't make it any more responsible. It, makes, <coughs> it means it more necessary in the interest of humanity and justice. And, and responsibility, so the responsibility uh, derives from, from focusing on all the circumstances, which will then lead the court to decide whether or not the writ should issue, whether... Uh, and it, it's not the case that responsibility is, is a legal question. It's not. It's not, a, it's not purely a legal question because many of the obligations that have been the basis upon which the court has issued the writ in the past are not legal obligations. No, well, that's, they are yeah, actions. Yeah, on but the then you're then you're going back to your first point. I mean, your your, prim, your primary case. I think what my lord and I are simply doing is querying whether respond. We understand exactly what the factors are on which you draw attention, and I see the force of them. I'm just wondering whether responsibility is the right legal is the right label for. Them. They seem to me to have much to do with making us responsible, making UK government responsible. Responsible for the current detention. That is the, that's oh, the right. critical. If, you, no, if you're nailing your colour to the mast of that label, um, so be it. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a factual question. You have to look at all the facts, it's not a legal question. No, I, we've got that, I've got that. Well, the, the, just taking up for an observation of my lord a, a moment ago. Um, uh, <coughs> Is responsibility here effectively the interests of justice? Yes. Right. Because that's what. So if, if power alone 
isn't sufficient, your alternative submission is power in circumstances where the interests of justice require that it be exercised. Yes, but the interests of justice will focus upon the role that the respondent is playing in respect of the detention. Um, uh, I, 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 unless the court has any further questions, those are my questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, my lady. This uh, case, or these cases, raise the issue whether those who are in camps in Syria can claim return to the United Kingdom as of right through habeas corpus. If so, then the effect of that is to bypass all of the usual processes with all of the judgments and the weighing of the range of factors that would be inherent in a request for and a consideration of consular assistance. And I'll come back to the point, but you should be aware that uh, consular assistance is also a discretionary decision that applies in relation to British nationals. Well, that's assuming what you've got to prove. I mean, that may be true about some forms of consular assistance, uh, but it depends what you include. It doesn't sound, unless you're going to show us some authority we aren't aware of, that asking for consular assistance in the form of the issue of travel documents to enable you to come back to this country um, uh, is an absolute right. Not it, 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 I'm not at the moment going to dispute that, that there is a right to travel documents if you present yourself at a British embassy. There is, however, no right and no correlative obligation on the United Kingdom government to assist a British national to get to a place in which they might be able to claim that right. That's what I mean by consular assistance. And it may therefore be that there are a whole series of steps that would need to be taken which would engage judgments by the United Kingdom as to whether or not, if you find the term consular assistance controversial for present purposes, whether the United Kingdom government is or is not prepared to take whatever proactive steps might be necessary to secure the return to the United Kingdom, for example, of a British subject or to produce a, get a person to a British embassy where they can exercise that right. <coughs> But my learned friend's case is a very stark one. It is, in effect, that de facto control means that the habeas writ runs as a right whenever a step or combination of steps to release <coughs> lie within the power of the state. And irrespective of the appropriateness as a matter of governmental judgment or the wisdom or even the good sense of taking that step, Put another way, if conditions are imposed by the detaining authority or the foreign state that is detaining that lie within the power of government to comply with, that's the UK government, then on her primary case they must be complied with as a matter of obligation correlative to the remedy of right that is habeas. I, I will come in due course to the uh, attempt to resile from the uh, answer to which I respectfully submit the logic of her case compels her that she gave to Lord Justice Holroyd yesterday in response to the hostages document. And my submission is going to be when I get there that uh, it is simply not possible in principle to cut and chop the conditions in the way that she sought to do to escape from the absurdity of the logic of the position that said yes, if they demand £10 million or £10, you've got to pay it. My submission is that there is nothing in the case law that leads to the position, primary or alternative, that she espouses uh, about the uh, way in which habeas works. On the contrary, and that is in principle, I right, to move to the place that she needs to get to to make habeas run here, uh, that is in principle not a step that the courts can incrementally uh, or should, in principle, take. Uh, my case is that the Divisional Court 
uh, carefully analysed the nature of the habeas jurisdiction and correctly analysed how that jurisdiction should operate or not in the circumstances of this, this case. I'll come at the end to the attempt now to erect some form of alternative case. Uh, in reality, we submit that is either just the primary case dressed up in different clothes, or to the extent that it is or purports to be something different or broader, extending beyond control. Uh, 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 we note first that absolutely nothing of that kind was floated or run below. That's not an in principle objection to your looking at the skeleton argument that is supplemental and considering it, but you do need to be a bit careful if uh, some of the submissions, as they appeared to do this morning, strayed into territory where uh, they were in effect, in effect asserting matters of uh, evidence or fact. But in any event, my submission is going to be on that alternative case that it is bad anyway. It is entirely unsupported by the case law. But there is not even uh, clarity as to the normative basis on which it said responsibility or the interest of justice should lie. Uh, and there is a, an obvious and very significant problem uh, with asserting uh, that uh, the sort of factors that she mentioned, uh, if grouped under the heading interests of justice, is it necessary for the court to intervene? There is a very significant problem case involving foreign detention, which is precisely the problem identified in Abbasi and al-Rawi, and that the Supreme Court felt able to swerve in Ramatullah. I say felt able to swerve because they uh, held that those concerns, legitimate in principle as they were, did not actually arrive on, uh, arise on the particular facts of Ramatullah, uh, not least because of the existence of the prior <coughs> detention and transfer and the international uh, ag agreements and arrangements uh, that base those. Uh, I submit that there are five particular features of this case that are of key importance. Uh, the person detained was never detained in the UK. The person detained was never detained by the UK abroad. So never detained in the UK, never detained by the UK abroad, <coughs> no question therefore of any transfer by the UK of the person to the foreign detaining power, no agreement or arrangement between the UK and the foreign detaining power giving the UK the power or the ability to call for the detained person, person simply to be transferred to there, that is the United Kingdom's custody or control. And there is, we note, no question of any illegality, domestic or international, by the UK in relation to the transfer uh, or the detention of the detained person, or indeed, if it is uh, attempted to be erected under the alternative case, uh, in relation to the conditions of detention to which they are subject. None of those matters are matters for which the UK bears any form of legal responsibility. I'm not going to go back through all the cases, but uh, the doctrine of international responsibility uh, under the ECHR, as my Lord noted, is well established. It exists through the prism of whether someone is within the jurisdiction of the state concerned, uh, under Article 1 of the ECHR, and there is no question of that here. See, if you need it, HF and France, which is uh, in, the, in the bundle. At tab 22, I think. But I wasn't going to take up uh, time with that. What that demonstrates is that the United Kingdom has no international responsibility. Uh, and uh, that problem isn't solved by relying on other potential international conventions which might be being breached by AANES, I make no case on that, uh, because likewise under those conventions there is no suggestion that the United Kingdom would bear any responsibility for any of that. Uh, so that's the, that's the basic structure of the submission. Uh, um, and I wanted so what to was your fifth point? I've got the fourth, I've got that, no question of any no, illegality. No question of any illegality. 
Yeah. What was domestic or international? <coughs> yeah. What was the fifth point? Or perhaps you said there were five key factors. That, well, that was the fifth point. Oh, I see. I may have missed an earlier one, or you may have elided. I've it got detect one detainee not detained in the UK. Two never, never detained, detained by, by the, UK. the UK. Sorry. Never detained by the UK is two. Yes. Three, no question of any transfer yeah. by the UK. Four, no agreement or arrangement. Oh, I see. I mean, they merge one into the other. You yes, see. I see. Probably it's yeah. consequential in the current. No, no, exactly. But I just didn't want to sort of miss any. <coughs> yep. So, uh, just uh, uh, some, <coughs> some submissions, if I may, briefly in relation to the case law and the way in which the habeas jurisdiction works. Uh, the first submission is that there is no case that supports or comes close to supporting the breadth of jurisdiction under habeas which my learned friend asserts. Uh, that was a point that was made uh, expressly, in effect, by uh, Lord Phillips in Ramatullah at paragraph 105. tab 12. It may be as well to have Ramatullah Supreme Court open because I'll touch on other cases but probably there that the references will be most frequent. So Lord Phillips, <coughs> Ramatullah 105. It, indeed, the case law... Sorry, just before you are yep. coming back to its say and I'll, I'll shut up, but... Um, <coughs> know from my debate with um, Mr. Kaufman how I read that bit of um, Lord Phillips's uh, judgment, but <coughs> Lord Reeves is a bit of a puzzle because it he too says it was Im um, important that uh, the UK was not the original detaining power. Um, Sorry, no, where, where, no, where have I got this? Anyway, um, is that one one five? Yeah, one one five. Yeah. One, 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 five. Yeah. Um, but he seems to say it for a completely different reason. Um, you, I imagine, were in Ramatullah. Well, there was a quite separate sort of um, conflicts point, was there? About well, conflicts is the wrong word, but there was a jurisdiction point, which wasn't about the jurisdiction of habeas in the way we're looking at it, but the jurisdiction because of where all this happened. Well, I'm, I, I'm not, there, 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 weren't, um, there weren't arguments based on that sort of right. conflict point. I think the concern that Lord Reed has is just to put down the marker that, that says, here's another point that hasn't been thought about. Yes, I see, I see. if you see what I mean, in, yes. in 115. So it, it may, may not matter, as you say, that Lord Phillips's point Stands anyway, but, but he's not really supporting Lord Phillips. Not not on that particular aspect. No, no. he's no. expressing serious doubt about the civil wrong point. No civil yes. wrong. Yeah. That's the second point in one one five. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it might be thought just so I don't forget to go to go there. It might be thought that the perhaps the key dispositive bit in Lord Reed's judgment on the facts is in one one two, page four five seven between D and E. You see, just three lines above above E, on its face, that agreement, you'll know the agreement that's being referred to, gave the Secretaries of State de facto control over Mr. Ramatullah's detention on the reasonable assumption that the United States would act in accordance with the agreement entered into. Which, which is almost the Lord Atkinson point. You'll recall the Lord Atkinson quotation that says, why should we assume that a foreign state will not yeah. abide by its agreement? But, uh, my lord, yes, I think there are slightly different ways of putting their reservations and their, their doubts. No, well, that's helpful. The key, the key of it is 104 and 105 of, of, of Lord Phillips. Yeah. And 115 uh, of, 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 Lord, of Lord Reed. So, in other words, the premise of the, the first sentence of 115 is that um, the United Kingdom did have control over yes. Mr. Ramatullah's <clears throat> detention initially, and, and the question was whether or not by transferring him 
to the United, the, the detention of the United. Yes, States. that control had been relinquished. But, but, uh, but under the with the um, Geneva Convention obligations and the obligation under the uh, MOU, that control had been relinquished. Yes, okay. and, and that takes one back to the passage I've just taken you to yes. in one one two. Exactly, as I described as the dispositive reasoning for him. But my mandate is right. You get the same point from the union one one five. But 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 the the, the point. For the moment, about there being no case that supports or comes close to the assertion of jurisdiction here, is that I, I, I mean, if you, if you go back to Lord Phillips at 104, second half, you will see there the reference to Abassi. saying if you if, if, if re, reposit the facts of O'Brien, he says in 104, and assume that they, they'd taken Mr. O'Brien on their own initiative, there hadn't been custody and detention by the UK followed by transfer subject to the conditions of the agreement that my lady just referred to. He says reposit those facts, assume that they, they the Irish Free State, grab Mr. O'Brien, but they're likely to be amenable to a request from the United Kingdom to release him. They say, well, that, that, that he says, well, the difficulty with <coughs> that is that that does take you into a Bassi territory. <coughs> that does take you into territory where there is a serious problem. And there's a serious problem because once you're in that territory, these are matters of judgment for the government. That's the significance of the JR versus habeas debate. They're matters of judgment for the Secretary of State, and they're, they're, this is territory where not merely will JR operate a light touch, but there are certain areas of the conduct of foreign relations where, per Abassi and the very well-known passages in 106, <coughs> 106 and 107 of Abassi, where the courts will treat those sorts of judgments as being forbidden territory, as Lord Phillips Yeah, well, I, I see all that, but that doesn't really have any application to the facts of this case, certainly so far as the dealings with the AANES are concerned, does it? Because there's no question of trying to persuade or decide whether they ought to persuade or what arguments to use <coughs> and so forth, the AANES. AANES have said, we'd like you to take them. Yes, but my Lord, we'll, we'll, we'll come to it when we get to the facts, but uh, uh, um, uh, you have got here a whole series of Things that have to be done, whether pursuant to uh, the conditionality, most of them are pursuant to the conditionality that Ains has imposed on the clear findings of fact of the divisional court, which aren't challenged. But you've got a series of areas uh, 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 and a series of steps that the United Kingdom has to undertake. Well, it, well it, I, I, I see that's what you say. If we're coming back to it, we'll, we'll see exactly what there's a man to, but yes. I, I'll come back to it, but the reason I'm there is because at this point of the argument, is because whether or not to take those steps yes. is a matter of judgment, is therefore, if you're going to challenge it, a matter of JR. So yeah. should we, for example, send someone from the consulate into the camps through dangerous parts of Syria to pick the people up at the camp? Should we engage in the diplomacy that is required, which I know my Lord has in mind, with the third country through which you'd have to travel to get them to an airport, and, and so on? All, all of that, and should we do all of those things? Should we expose uh, uh, people to risk? Should we engage in that diplomatic capital? All of those, um, all against the backdrop of a concern about national security risks. But should we engage in all of those questions, in all of those steps, is a matter of judgment, and that is inimical and directly inconsistent with the idea that here's a remedy of right that simply flows from control because you can comply with them. Once you do that, that's why I say habeas versus JR conceals more than simply a procedural question. Because what, what, what they're ultimately trying to do, the reason they have gone for habeas, let's make no bones about this, the reason they've gone for habeas is because they positively assert that it is a remedy of right and correlative obligation. So what they then do is to set the control conditions in the way that they do and say everything else is irrelevant. But the problem is that everything else 
is precisely the stuff of government judgment and decision making, which would otherwise then be the subject of a judicial review. So this isn't just a procedural question. The moment you've got steps that have to be taken, and on their case they just say, well, that, that's just to give effect to the writ as of right, so they've got to do them. You remove any element of discretion in the government as to whether or not they think it's a good, bad, or a thoroughly indifferent idea to take those steps to expose members of the consulate to the risk of going through Syria, to engage in the diplomatic capital, all of that. And you move it from JR with a super light touch because of the nature of those decisions, if at all, into something I which is a pure matter of obligation. The, the points are even if we continue to exclude witness statement three, there's sufficient evidence that these are actually things which can be done and are quite routinely done, despite the risks and difficulties, which I don't underestimate. Um, so that if we were applying a JR test, the government might find it less easy than it would in other circumstances to say, well, this is all a matter for our discretion, when they have been doing it regularly for some time. Well, they haven't been doing it regularly for some time. Well, a, uh, and, well and, and if, we ex if we exclude Kenyan 3, although you may make me revisit on that. Kenyan 3 refers to one English case that happened shortly before the hearing. The rest of them are foreign country cases. Well, is that... Uh, anyway, uh, let's not get into okay. that debate. The point you raise is a point of principle, and my answer is the same. Whether or not this has happened in relation to people connected with Britain or British citizens is a matter of judgment in each case which involves where in the whole series of factors are we going to go down this road, what are the risks associated with it, what are the diplomatic consequences of it, is this the sort of case in which we want to do that, and we think it's appropriate to do that for particular or peculiar humanitarian reasons, uh, weighing up all of those matters. It doesn't matter whether it's been done by the United Kingdom in the past, it doesn't matter whether other countries have done it, because they will view things differently. What matters is that those are as a matter of public law, <coughs> steps which require governmental judgment. And what this application, trying to use the habeas jurisdiction in this way, does, and deliberately, if sub silentio seeks to do, is to cut that out and say, no, 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 that's not a matter of decision making for government or JR. If you can get there, we could have a debate on JR or not. It, it's just a matter of obligation. <coughs> And whilst we're on there, so that's the very point I respectfully submit <laughs> that, that Lord Phillips is, is dealing with at 104 in his repositing of the facts of O'Brien to make them look very like the facts of our case, and, and then saying that that would be a Bassi problem. That would create an Abassi problem because it would create a series of judgments that would need to be done, and by the way, we wouldn't go there as a matter of JR. But they are fundamentally matters of judgment for the government. Now, the question is whether anyone else in the Supreme Court took a different view of that, and the answer is they didn't. Because if you go, for example, to uh, 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 Lord Kerr, and you go to paragraph 70, what he says is, in effect, well, the legality of what the US did wouldn't have been and isn't in issue. So you don't get to the problem, slightly separate problem, of having to, the English courts having to grapple with, and this takes on into foreign act of state and so on, you don't have to grapple with that there because the legality of the US's detention on Lord Kerr's view of the world is, is not going to be an issue. And that, no doubt, he thinks, is because of the clarity of the MOU and the various arrangements and the Geneva Convention. He says it was clear that they're under an obligation simply to return on request without more. And so if one is looking at the O'Brien recast example in 104 and then says, well, how does that fit with Moena and Sanko and all of that? Well, you see those cases, that's Moena, M M Moena and Sanko, analysed by Lord Kerr at 55 and following is uh, Moena, all the way through to 62, picking up Sanko, uh, in paragraph 61 and analysing that. 
but none of those are analysed even by Lord Kerr on the basis that there's some prospect of a reaction to a Secretary of State's request to the foreign country. On the contrary, Lord Kerr's analysis is much tighter than that and implicitly at least accepts that more is required than simply the ability to make the request with the possibility or the probability that it will be answered by the foreign power. That's why, when we come to it, he places such emphasis on the existence, as do all of their other lordships and her ladyship. That's why they place such emphasis on the fact of initial detention, the loss of control, uh, the transfer to the United States, and the nature of the arrangements that accompanied that transfer. That's why they can't answer yes, the question. It's not really fair to say that they all placed emphasis on the fact of initial detention. They all placed emphasis on the existence of the MOU, its self-reflecting uh, obligation under the Geneva Convention. Uh, but you're entitled to say there wouldn't have been an MOU in the first place if there hadn't been an initial detention and a transfer. And there, would, yeah, there wouldn't have been an MOU and you wouldn't have had triggered the GC obligation. They are dependent on those two no, grants. Just to finish this point, if you go back to Sanko, which is at tab five, and you go to Mr. Justice Elias you will see that he rejects the idea that it's enough that you can ask the question you might get a, a yes answer. He rejects the idea that anything like that is sufficient for the concept of control under habeas. See, for that purpose, paragraph 28 on page 181 through to 31. see how though that feature, the absence of control as it were, relates into and ties into this Abbasi point that I've just been banging on about and, and how these are matters of judgment for the government, you'll see that those thoughts are both reflected when you get to the Court of Appeal in the next tab, page 189 and 190. Start if you would with paragraph 12 on page 190 in the judgment of the Court of Appeal, the judgment of Lord Justice Law was in effect for the Court of Appeal. <coughs> that doesn't give you the degree of control that might justify the issue of the writ. And the relationship, or the, as it were, the wash into the having to take steps, having to make judgment about steps, diplomacy, and all of that. Last bit of paragraph 9 on the previous page 189, if you would, about six lines up from the bottom, you will see a sentence that begins, it seems to me, moreover, looking at the matter more broadly, I just invite you to read from there to the end of the paragraph, in paragraph nine. The second submission uh, I make is that the essential features of the cases in which the writ has run is that the person to whom the writ is addressed has control of custody or control of the conditions of detention. In essence, who controls the custody is the question. That that is the question. Sorry, yes, sir. Why do you add <coughs> and conditions of the custody? Conditions of detention. Conditions of detention. Well, I mean, one may not need it if it's conditions. No, I, of I, I wasn't. 
Uh, Maybe it just complicates it. I think, I think it does. Um, but control. Anyway, okay, that's what I've written down in Control of Custody. Control of Custody, C for that purpose. Ramatullah, if you go back to tab 12. Lord Care, paragraph uh, 52. Second sentence of 52, critical if not the central issue in the case as I've sought to demonstrate above, that's O'Brien, is that there was reason to conclude that the Home Secretary had control over Mr O'Brien's release. 54, bottom of the page, the final sentence on that page, this is to be contrasted, dealing with Zabrowski, with the present case where the Court of Appeal has unequivocally found that there was sufficient reason to, to conclude that the Secretary of State would be able to assert control over the custody of Mr. Ramatullah. 57. Last sentence. Whereas in O'Brien there were strong grounds for believing that the Home Secretary had not lost control over Mr. O'Brien's detention. In Bowenia, no such grounds existed. 60. Third sentence, para 60, its judgment merely reflects, and the Court of Appeals judgment merely reflects the Court's conclusion that there were sufficient grounds for believing that the UK Government had the means of, con of obtaining control over the custody of Mr Ramatullah. And uh, uh, for good measure, I don't want to keep banging, banging the citations, but Lord Reid, you will see, in paragraph 109, agrees with, in effect, Lord Justice uh, Vaughan Williams in Seggone, uh, and uh, Seggone, just for your note, was cited with approval in paragraph 43 of Lord Kerr's judgment, but you'll see the citation of relevance from paragraph 109 in Lord Reed, same bet, it's a, a, just above the letter uh, or between letters F and G, follows that the appropriate respondent for the writ is in principle the person who has custody or control, or it's been sometimes put actual custody or constructive custody of the prisoner, that is to say either the actual jailer or some other person who has such control over the imprisonment that he could order the release of the prisoner. A and that, we submit, does capture the essence of the habeas jurisdiction you must be able to set the conditions of release and uh, the call for release without more. Uh, that should be, that has got to be your power, as it were, if you're going to be the proper respondent to the writ. A and the focus in Ramatullah was, of course, on the UK having both that power and that obligation uh, under the MOU to call for release and indeed the obligation under the Geneva Conventions precisely because they had detained and had transferred in the circumstances that you're well aware of. And so if someone else can set the conditions of release, uh, that is effectively that. Uh, the question then, of course, becomes a very different one. If you, if you don't have the power to call, as it were, unconditionally for release, and the other uh, detaining party has the power to set conditions, the question becomes a very different one which is whether the conditions imposed by the detainer should be complied with. And of course, the moment you get into that game, the question raises all sorts of different and constitutionally differently located questions, judgments, right. weighing of factors, and all of that. They're probably worth expatiating on after lunch. Yes, my lord, sorry. Then, uh, now, uh, I think, that because of our intervention, Ms. Cowcombe went on rather longer than we were expecting, but you're comfortable you'll finish this afternoon and give her enough time to reply. Good? That's two o'clock.